the journey that we've had. Oops. So in 1997, there was a fire in the San Bernardino Mountains, and I always like to share that I was down in the valley. I had lived in the mountains at that point, uh, approximately 15 years, and I came out of a movie theater down in the valley in San Bernardino, and I saw this plume of smoke, very similar to the one in the picture, on the highway leading up into the San Bernardino Mountains. And my first thought was not, oh my gosh, the mountain's on fire. What about my family? What about my pets, my children, my community? My first thought was if I was going to have to take a long way home because we had fires in the mountains in those days. I'd lived there for 15 years and the fire departments always put the fires out. That's what they do. That's what they're good at. And I had no concern about my community because the fire departments always protected us. Uh, I did have to go the long way home that day. And sí tuvo que tomar la ruta más larga esa. at 1,500 acres, and it burnt about 12 homes. And our community did nothing except put out little cans to raise money for the people who lost their homes. We didn't change our lifestyle. We didn't look at our homes to see if they were in danger because the fire departments always put fires out. Um, the fi That particular fire had started in the Forest Service area, and the Forest Service closed that section of the mountain. They reopened it another a year later, and we became enraged because how dare they expose us to the dangers of fire coming from people misbehaving in the forest. And we formed an organization called the Front Country Alliance. Our goal was to find out what we could do to stop these terrible government agencies, and I'm being facetious, from exposing us to danger. Um, fortunately, we became educated and realized that we had to look at ourselves. What were we doing to protect ourselves from fire? The first responder's job is to put the fires out, but we need to look at it from a preventative standpoint. What can we do to prevent fires? And with the assistance of Cal Fire Battalion Chief Steve Ferris, we found out about something called fire safe councils and that's communities coming together working with our first responder partners be it cal fire the forest service your county fire departments your local fire departments and others to work together to build a more fire resilient community and so in 1999 we formed the mountain rim fire safe council myself and a couple others worked with cal fire and traveled throughout the Inland Empire, establishing fire safe councils, as we found these partnerships really helped educate us in what we needed to do to be more fire safe. In 2000, there were a series of grants that became available because it's great to educate people, but often we need help, whether that help is in providing educational materials, holding special events, or achieving grants, acquiring grants that can help people do the work they need to do. The challenge was we weren't grant writers. So we would get together different people from all our little fire safe councils, and we would talk about how to fill out these complicated grant forms. That led to an organization we called the Inland Empire Fire Safe Alliance. We found out that by networking with each other at the community level, the citizens, that we became even stronger in our efforts for fire prevention and education. And we also learned that we could negotiate better with the different entities we were working with. Throughout the Inland Empire, which is primarily two large counties, you know, there's a lot of difference in how the agencies and the county governments and the cities address fire prevention and fire response. And we found out as citizens, if we work together, we could create like a uniformity and we would that way we would all be working on the same page. In 2002 and three, we started focusing on community evacuation preparedness. This was very, very important because up until that time, we had not necessarily had to evacuate on a large scale. It was good that we did that because in 2003, 
we had a series of wildfires throughout the state of California, especially San Diego, San Bernardino County. And in our area, it was the Grand Prix fire in the Angeles National Forest, the Padua fire on that side, and then the old fire in the San Bernardino Mountains. That resulted in several hundreds of thousands of people being evacuated and hundreds of thousands of acres lost. This is a picture of our high school on the mountaintop. And you can see how the fire came right up the front of the mountain. And literally uh, the first responders were able to stop the fire at the highway there. That's Highway 18 in the San Bernardino Mountains. In our mountains, we lost four or 500 homes. Um, the good news is in the San Bernardino Mountains, we were able to evacuate 60 to 100,000 people without incident. And there was no loss of life directly related to the fire because of the preparation, because of our partnerships with our first responder agencies. Many of you might be familiar with the old Santa's Village. Um, the Santa's Village was a theme park in the mountain that was established in the 50s. And it too was damaged in the fire. A lot of historical landmarks, buildings and resources were lost in the 03 fires. But it did set a new uh, bar for us in terms of realizing fire will come into the mountains. We'd learned a lot since 1997 when we were used to the fire departments just putting out the fires. Sometimes during a firestorm, it's overwhelming and it's more than they can do. They have to pick and choose what they can, what they can protect and what they can't. And often things still get burnt. Communities are still lost, homes are lost. In the event of the 2003 fires in our area, we were fortunate there were no loss of life as a direct result of that fire, which was caused by an arsonist. The San Diego fires at the same time did experience a loss of life because many people were not prepared for evacuation and they had trouble leaving. People don't realize that sometimes during a major fire like this, the actual smoke itself can create situations where your car, it can interfere with the operation of your vehicles. People would drive off the road because the smoke was so intense and thick, they could not see the roads. So there was a loss of life experienced in San Diego, most directly to failure to be able to evacuate in a timely fashion. Our challenge as fire safe councils and communities and our partnerships with the first responders is to accept this picture you see is not the reality. If there is a fire, you cannot be guaranteed that there will be a fire engine in your driveway, nor can you be assured that there will be a, an airplane, an air tanker dropping retired retardant or water on top of your home. You have to be prepared yourself you have to have your property prepared and you have to be ready to go so that they can do their job. I think this is a great picture, but again, it's not reality. You can't plan on this being a part of what's going, what you may experience in a wildfire. It's very, very important to understand that we have to depend upon ourselves. We have a saying in our area that we provide the defense and the first responders provide the offense. It is our responsibility to prepare our properties, our families, our neighborhoods, our communities for what to do and how to be prepared for the, the reality of wildfire. Because it is not if, it is when wildfire will hit our communities, especially in Southern California. So our goals, make more connections. It's not just first responders. We need to partner with utilities. We need to partner with education, our schools, evacuating schools, evacuating camps, making these connections so that we are all on the same page is critical. Communication. We've come a long way since our Fire Safe Council started in 1998. We didn't have email. We didn't have Facebook. Um, everything we did, we passed out flyers at the library, is in the markets. The communication now is so open and so available that let's take advantage of that so that we're all educated and we're all working for the same goal. Partnerships, 
It's critical that there's no more us versus them. The first responder agencies, whether it is the fire departments, the sheriffs, the CHP, the dispatchers, we're all in this together and we all need to work together to have a successful survival from a wildfire. Wildfire will happen. It is part of mother nature. But illuminating the us versus them in our area is one of the achievements that we are most proud of. We're happy to sit at the table with all of our agency partners. We also have many projects. We help with fuel reduction with people that cannot physically or fiscally afford to prepare their property. That's part of our education and outreach. We're educating people on what they call resilient landscape. That's your defensible space around your homes. And then home hardening. This is a newer phrase, but it's looking at your structure itself and what we can do to make the home better protected against wildfire and better able to survive wildfire. In closing in this section, remember it's always better together. Here we have Smokey Bear and Cal Fire's mascot, Captain Cal, but the citizens in the background that are enjoying something called Pinecone Festival. Again, this is how we work together to make a big difference, both in fire prevention, preparedness, mm -hmm. and after the event in recovery. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Henry. Great. Well, thank you, Laura. And thank you. For... Oops, sorry, Henry. I think you are muted. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Laura, for that wonderful presentation and for touching on a lot of topics. There's definitely a lot there to think about and, and a lot of things uh, that, that we all must do to do our part. Okay. And before we go ahead and get started with Henry, um, I wanted everyone uh, before we move on to Henry, he will be doing his presentation in Spanish. So for those of you who are in, in the interpretation line in Spanish, if you could move over to the English um, interpretation line, you can hear it in Spanish. But for those of you who need assistance in English, if you could all swap over to the Spanish interpretation, I know it sounds confusing, but if you can uh, swap over to the Spanish interpretation, Natalia, our interpreter, will be uh, translating into English. So to make it less confusing, uh, for those of you in Spanish, please translate over to this line. And then for those of you who need assistance in tra um, translating it in English, please swap over to the Spanish interpretation line. Okay, I hope that wasn't confusing, but if you need it interpreted in English, please swap over to the Spanish translation. Okay, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Gracias, Vanessa. Pues, uh, buenos días. Como les dije, me llamo Henry Herrera. Uh, Spanish to English. So hello, this is Henry Herrera. He is um, the uh, supervisor uh, in el sur de California for the Departamento de Silvicultura y Protección contra Incendios de California, conocida como Cal Fire. Esta presentación la estoy, la voy a presentar en, en par, de parte de mi compañero David Haas, que es el silvicultor de la unidad de San Bernardino de Cal Fire. Hoy voy a hablar sobre quién, quiénes somos, dónde trabajamos, qué es lo que hacemos, a qué se debe de hacer antes de un incendio, durante un incendio y después de un incendio. Este es un organigrama de cómo está organizada Cal Fire. Uh, el departamento Cal Fire trabaja junto con la Junta de Silvicultura y Protección contra Incendios. Uh, la Junta nos, es un organismo de, designado por CAL FIRE y es responsable de desarrollar la, la política forestal general del Estado, determina las políticas de orientación del departamento 
y representa los intereses del Estado en las tierras forestales federales de California y estatales. Uh, la Junta trabaja con el Departamento de Bosques, Cal Fire, para llevar a cabo el mandato de la legislatura de California de proteger y mejorar los recursos forestales del Estado. Cal Fire es conocido como el Departamento de Bomberos de California y nosotros trabajamos, tenemos tres ramas principales. Una es uh, la administración de recursos naturales. Uh, la otra rama es la oficina del jefe de bomberos del estado y también el manejamiento de los incidentes cuando respondemos a emergencias. El departamento está organizado en unidades administrativas. Tenemos un total de 21 unidades administrativas en el estado cubriendo los 58 condados de California y el departamento está dividido en dos regiones, en la región del norte y en la región del sur. También tenemos seis condados contractuales. Estos son los condados de Kern, Los Ángeles, Marín, Orange, Santa Bárbara y Ventura. Son condados donde nosotros tenemos un contrato con los departamentos de bomberos de esos condados para que nos ayuden a, a prevenir y a combatir los incendios forestales en áreas donde el estado tiene la responsabilidad de hacer eso. Un ejemplo de cómo están las unidades organizadas es, uh, voy a utilizar la, la unidad de San Bernardino. La unidad de San Bernardino es la unidad más grande en el estado geográficamente. Cubre el condado de San Bernardino, que es el condado más grande en la nación, uh, y el condado Eño y Mono. Eso es aproximadamente un, un quinto del, del estado de California. Uh, también es la unidad administrativa del contrato que tenemos con el Departamento de Bomberos del Condado de Los Ángeles. Uh, tiene cuatro campamentos de conservación. Estos son campamentos donde uh, prisioneros estatales uh, han, han voluntado para aprender a ser bomberos y nos ayudan a combatir los incendios cuando Uh, necesitamos su ayuda. Entonces, uh, les pagan mínimo, reciben entrenamiento como bomberos y también les reducen el tiempo que van a estar en la casa. And it also reduces their sentence time um, in prison. This helps them that once they um, leave prison, they are already certified, trained, um, and have the skills and the knowledge um, to find work as firefighters. And this is in collaboration um, with the State Department, um, with the uh, yeah, State Department, or the Rehabilitation in California. And there's also one center of um, firefighters where we have a training center um, in There, so it's the office that when 911 is called, this is the principal office for this unit, and it has a total of 13 fire stations. And these are the firefighters that respond to emergencies, and not only wildfires, um, but also anything with, um, you know, like if there are accidents and the fire uh, cars catch fire, um, and anybody needs medical assistance um, or in that kind of emergency, um, these stations respond to that. And then there are two main um, uh, um, contracts with the cities of Highland and Yucaipa, and they have contracted Cal Fire to be their. Um, a department of local firefighter firefighters that respond in case of any emergency. So Cal Fire doesn't only respond. Pero responde a cualquier to, emergencia y también está disponible para que ciudades o condados lo contraten como su departamento local. El siguiente tema es la jurisdicción. Uh, Cal Fire tiene el trabaja principalmente en áreas de responsabilidad estatales. Estas son áreas donde el Estado 
Cal Fire tiene la responsabilidad financiera de prevenir y combatir incendios uh, forestales. En este mapa, esta es el, el área amarillo, SRA, State Responsibility Area. Esas son las áreas donde el estado de California tiene la responsabilidad. Y las áreas verdes son las áreas donde el, el gobierno federal es responsable de, de prevenir y suprimir incendios. Y luego las áreas grises, esas son las áreas donde el gobierno local, por ejemplo, los, los departamentos de bomberos de las ciudades o de los condados, son responsables de, de prevenir y, y apagar los incendios que ocurren. Uh, Cal Fire es responsable de aproximadamente 31 millones de acres de tierras silvestres. Ese es el área pues, bajo nuestra responsabilidad. Y esa área incluye uh, propiedad privada principalmente. También tenemos áreas de protección directa, DPA. Estas es, son las áreas con la responsabilidad de protección contra incendios forestales que es negociada, creada y acordada por las unidades administrativas de las agencias federales o estatales. Entonces, por ejemplo, puede haber un área donde el Estado tiene la responsabilidad, pero a lo mejor está más cerca una estación de bomberos federal. Entonces tenemos un contrato para que el gobierno federal nos ayude a prevenir y apagar fuegos forestales en esa área, en aunque sea del Estado, pero el gobierno federal es, es responsable. Y también puede trabajar de la otra manera. Puede haber un área federal donde el Estado responde. Todo esto es, es uh, bajo contratos, acuerdos. Como Laura dijo en su presentación, nada de lo que hacemos lo hacemos solo. Lo hacemos con la ayuda, con la asistencia de agencias federales, locales, estatales, organizaciones de fines sin lucro y, y cualquier o, otra organización o distrito, agencia, que, compañía privada que, que nos pueda ayudar. Entonces, ahora voy a hablar qué se hace antes de un incendio para prevenir los incendios, reducir el riesgo del, de los incendios. Uh, la, las unidades de Cal Fire tienen lo que le llaman un, un plan de, de, de incendios. Uh, este es un plan estratégico que cada unidad tiene para determinar qué pasos van a hacer para reducir el riesgo de los incendios, para prevenirlos. Uh, hab tienen, hablan sobre la historia del, del, de los fuegos, uh, el tipo de vegetación, la topografía, las comunidades, uh, los recursos disponibles, um, sobre las carreteras, diferentes compañías u o agencias también que, que están en el área y luego determinan qué es, qué es necesario, qué tipo de proyectos, qué tipo de información o educación, uh, qué tipo de acciones tiene que tomar la unidad para reducir el riesgo a las comunidades dentro de su unidad. Otra cosa de las que hacemos y también es identificado en ese plan son las inspecciones de áreas defensibles en zonas residenciales. Aquí puede ver un ejemplo, una casa en el lado izquierdo que tiene mucha vegetación, muchos árboles, uh, mucho pasto, pasto largo, pasto seco. Algunas ramas están muertas. Uh, la, la casa está escondida. Um, hay un tanque de, de gas cerca de, de los árboles. Y al lado derecho es una casa que tiene espacio defensible. La vegetación está verde, uh, la riegan, han removido uh, pasto seco, las hojas, ramas muertas alrededor de la casa. Uh, el, el número de la casa es, es fácil de encontrar. La carretera es fácil de entrar y salir del área. Entonces, es, Cal Fire es responsable de, de hacer esas inspecciones en las áreas estatales. Um, y también 
trabaja con los gobiernos locales para que los gobiernos locales hagan lo mismo en, en áreas uh, ur urbanas y ellos pueden tener uh, requerimientos más estrictos que el Estado. Y todo esto es bajo el Código de los Recursos Públicos uh, 4291. Otra de las cosas que hacemos uh, son proyectos de reducción del material combustible de, de la vegetación. Determinamos áreas que tienen alto riesgo de, de fuegos, áreas que tienen árboles muertos, secos, árboles que están siendo atacados por plagas o tienen alguna enfermedad, uh, áreas donde no, que no se han quemado en mucho tiempo. Entonces el combustible ha, ha aumentado. Um, áreas cercas de las casas, de las comunidades, uh, junto a las carreteras. Entonces, uh, determinamos es, esos peligros, trabajamos con los uh, residentes, con los dueños de las propiedades, con organizaciones como el Mountain Rim Fire Safe Council, la organización uh, de LORA, y otras, otras agencias de gobierno para determinar qué es lo que se tiene que hacer, si se tienen que remover árboles, uh, si se tienen que podar, um, si se tiene que, uh, en este caso, parece que los árboles tenían alguna plaga, estaban siendo matados por insectos, uh, probablemente por los escarabajos de corteza, y entonces lo que hicieron es removieron los árboles que estaban infectados, y los cubrieron con un plástico para que el, el escarabajo se, se muera y no pueda escapar de esa madera. Y después de un tiempo vienen y la madera se puede utilizar o para uh, leña, por ejemplo, uh, o, o la pueden uh, moler y dejar que, que la madera se descomponga en la tierra y que los, los árboles puedan utilizar esa madera como nutrientes. Um, otra de las cosas que hacemos es, uh, son los fuegos prescritos um, o, o, o los fuegos controlados. Determinamos áreas que tienen riesgo alto de fuegos y tomamos precauciones para um, quemar esa área en un día después de que hemos removido material seco, hemos instalado líneas de contención, tenemos los recursos necesarios, los bomberos, las máquinas pesadas. Uh, aviones o helicópteros si es necesario, uh, días donde, que no son muy calurosos, días cuando no hay viento, días que el humo no va a soplar hacia áreas urbanas, uh, tiempo del año que no va a afectar a, las, a los animales silvestres, por ejemplo, y, y lo, lo quemamos. Entonces eso resulta en un, en un fuego de baja intensidad con llamas que no sean muy altas y el fuego no avanza muy rápido. Es un, es un fuego prescrito, es un fuego que va a limpiar el suelo, va a remover vegetación muerta, seca, las ramas, las hojas y va, va, va a limpiar el, el bosque, va a mejorar la salud, lo va a hacer más resistente a incendios. Otra de las cosas que hacemos es uh, tenemos que cumplir con las reg reg regulaciones de seguridad contra incendios dentro del área uh, del estado de responsabilidad. Estos son los códigos de regulaciones de, de California 1270 a 1276 que requieren que haya acceso y salida en caso de emergencia que los edificios tengan uh, los letreros y la numeración necesaria para que podamos identificar los, los edificios y que podamos encontrar los edificios necesarios en cuando estemos respondiendo a una emergencia. Las normas de emergencia sobre el agua para que haya acceso a agua en caso de, un, de una emergencia. Y también las... And then there's also different rules of how to modify um, the um, fuel or like combustible material. And this can help reduce the risk of wildfires. Another thing that we do is um, we give uh, grants. 
distritos. We give grants to nonprofit organizations. Otras agencias de gobierno para que ellos puedan diseñar y, e implementar proyectos para reducir material combustible, uh, para mejorar la salud de los bosques, para trabajar en áreas urbanas. Um, uno, de, uno de esos programas de subvenciones es, por ejemplo, el programa de mejoramiento forestal de California, que ayuda a, a dueños de propiedad privada que tienen áreas con, con árboles. Uh, y también el otro, otro programa es la asistencia voluntaria contra incendios. Entonces aquí tenemos la oficina del jefe de bomberos del estado, que es responsable de los, de los códigos de construcción, el entrenamiento estatal contra incendios, la seguridad de las tuberías de, de utilidades, la planificación del uso de la tierra y también es responsable de uh, crear los mapas de gravedad de zonas de peligro de incendio. Cal Fire trabaja bajo el código público de recursos 4201, 4204 y, y otros códigos adicionales que están aquí que requieren que, que hagamos estos mapas, los mapas de, de zonas severas del, del peligro de los incendios. Este mapa identifica áreas donde el peligro de los fuegos es uh, moderado, alto o muy alto. Y este mapa es, uh, lo repasamos anualmente. También uh, tenemos campañas para informar y educar al público. Por ejemplo, la campaña Ready, Set, Go, listo, ya vaya, que es lo que residentes pueden hacer antes, durante los incendios para prepararse, para estar listos para evacuar, cómo prepararse, que tener listos, que ropa, medicina, um, números de, de teléfono um, y también la campaña One Less Spark, One Less Wildfire. Uh, una chispa menos, un incendio forestal menos. Aquí hay varios recursos que tenemos para la supresión de los incendios. Cuando ocurre un incendio, escuadrillas de bomberos. Esta escuadrilla arriba en el lado izquierdo es una escuadrilla de, de prisioneros que están, tienen el uniforme anaranjado. Esos son los que trabajan en nuestros uh, campamentos de conservación. Tenemos nuestros camiones de bomberos, helicópteros, máquinas pesadas para remover el material combustible. Los helicópteros pueden aplicar agua directamente a las llamas. Los, uh, los aviones pueden aplicar um, el, el, este material rojo que se ve. Es como es un tipo de fertilizante que se aplica enfrente del incendio para que una vez que el fuego llegue allí, no pueda seguir avanzando o, o, o avance más despacio para que los bomberos lo puedan apagar. Durante el incidente, uh, usamos el, el comandante, el sistema de comandante del incidente, Ensign Command System, ICS, que es un sistema que usa el militar. Uh, el encargado del, del incidente es el comandante de incidentes. Directamente bajo esa persona trabaja el oficial de seguridad, el oficial de enlace y el oficial de información pública. Esta, esta gente es conocida como el personal del mando. Y debajo de eso hay cuatro secciones. La sección de operaciones, que son los que están combatiendo el fuego. La sección de finanzas, que es la sección que determina de quién va a pagar por qué recurso y cómo se va a pagar. La sección de logística, 
que determina um, de dónde van a venir, dónde vamos a tener nuestro campamento, por ejemplo, dónde van a dormir los bomberos, dónde van a comer, uh, dónde van a agarrar su equipo que necesitan. Y la sección de planificación, que es la sección que, que planea qué es lo que todos van a hacer y cuándo. Esto es conocido como el personal general. Otra cosa que hacemos es la reparación de supresión. Cuando combatimos los incendios, tenemos que utilizar máquinas pesadas, uh, bomberos con, con sierras, removemos árboles, vegetación, cercos. A veces dañamos utilidades que están debajo de la tierra, carreteras. Entonces, una vez que el, el peligro ha sido reducido o el fuego ya ha pasado, con los mismos bomberos y recursos, a veces con la ayuda de contratistas, regresamos al área que, donde estuvimos trabajando para reparar esa área, reparar los cercos, uh, la carretera, las utilidades, la infraestructura, y trabajamos con los dueños para um, recompensarlos de cualquier daño que haya ocurrido en su propiedad. Y también para reducir el riesgo de, de los deslaves, uh, de las inundaciones, Queremos que la tierra, la naturaleza pueda ser rehabilitada, restaurarla a, a lo que, como estaba antes del fuego, lo más que se pueda. También tenemos uh, equipos de respuesta de emergencia de cuencas hidrográficas. En inglés son conocidos como Watershed Emergency Response Teams. Y este, estos equipos hacen una evaluación de de cómo, qué intenso fue el fuego, dónde quemó, dónde son las áreas donde hay más riesgo de que hay, ocurra erosión, deslaves, inundaciones. Y trabajamos con, con los uh, residentes, con los dueños, con las varias agencias de gobierno para tomar acción, para determinar dónde está el riesgo y qué es lo que uno tiene que hacer para reducir ese riesgo. Porque una vez que el fuego... Uh, es apagado, luego vienen las lluvias, luego viene el, el invierno y es cuando hay otro tipo de riesgo. Es todo lo que tengo. Les quiero agradecer por su tiempo y puedo contestar algunas preguntas que tienen. En el, si hay preguntas en el futuro, um, yo se las puedo mandar a Henry por correo electrónico y se las pueden mandar para ustedes. O las pueden poner en el chat. Henry, una... ¿Sí? ¿Puedo hacer la pregunta ahora o por favor? Oh, yeah, sí. Uh -huh. ah. Una pregunta, Henry. Um, para las personas que no viven cerca de áreas eh, propensas a incendios, ¿Cómo, en tu experiencia, cómo les haces entender que también eh, les afectan ¿no? este tipo de, de incendios como para crear conciencia un poco más eh, grande? Sí, sí no, pues, pues tienes razón. Hoy en día, de verdad, les afecta a todos. <ríe> todo, todo, cualquier parte del estado se, se va a quemar algún día. Um, y los fuegos forestales no solo ocurren en las áreas forestales. Ahora estamos viendo que los fuegos forestales están quemando en, en ciudades enteras. Uh, y cuando un incendio comienza en, el, en un área urbana, también va hacia el bosque. Entonces esto definitivamente es algo que afecta a todos. Cuando los vientos de Santa Ana soplan aquí en el sur de California, Muchas de las veces uh, no hay nada que podemos hacer aparte de evacuar, removernos el peligro hasta que, que los vientos se calman y entonces ya podemos combatir el fuego. Pero sí, es algo que uh, yo siempre les recomiendo a la gente, como les dije, es, es los requerimientos del espacio defensible no, no solo son para las, las áreas rurales. Oh, eso aplica... A, a todo el estado, en aunque vivan en un área urbana. Uh, las campañas de información y educación es una cosa que, que ayuda, 
pero también los, los gobiernos locales, los bomberos de las ciudades y del condado también hacen inspecciones. Entonces ellos también andan yendo de casa en casa, propiedad a propiedad, informando a la gente y requiriendo que, que esos dueños tomen los, los pasos necesarios para reducir el riesgo. Y como Laura dijo, uh, si el dueño, el residente toma acción antes del fuego, si toma esa, esa ofensa, esas son las casas o las propiedades que tienen mejor probabilidad de sobrevivir un incendio porque son las, las casas que tienen un, una herramienta, un área para que los bomberos puedan estar y defender, trabajar en caso de un fuego. Entonces, ese espacio defensible es un área donde los bomberos pueden trabajar, el riesgo es menos y pueden trabajar alrededor de las propiedades de la casa para de, defender esa casa. Muchas gracias. Um, eh, por último, tenemos una pregunta en inglés. Dice, beside home encampment, arsons and baby shower being common fire starters, what are some of the most common wildfire starter and as home as well? And how can the community leaders educate people to pay attention to these things? Yeah. Um... So, you know, it, the, everything, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, you mentioned a couple of, of uh, causes that start wildfires. Um, you know, it, somebody could be driving along a highway and, and throw out a cigarette. Um, it, somebody could be driving up a grade and their car overheats and, and they pull over and, and they park on the shoulder that has dried vegetation. Um, you know, the Santana winds, uh, they, they can cause power lines to fall over and uh, a power line could, could spark a fire. Um, somebody might be trying to do the right thing and, and uh, weed whacking the, their, their vegetation and, and the weed whacker hits a rock and sparks a fire. Um, so it, 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 we've seen everything cause fires. Um, you know, Laura, Laura mentioned the, the old fire that was caused by, by an arsonist. Um, and, and so all of those things, you know, and, and it's not, you know, that might be the ignition, but, but then there's, a, there are other things that, that increase the fire danger, you know, the, the drought, overgrown vegetation, um, not, ha not meeting defensible space requirements. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a combination of things. Um, it could be an accident, um, but, but, but we see it all. Bueno, gracias, Henry. Um, y puedes seguir viendo los comentarios. Ahora podemos pasar al siguiente um, presentación. Uh, the next presentation is it um, Laura or is it going to be Elba? Laura. Laura, are you going to move back to English? Yes. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, so if you can, um, and then Henry, if you can stop sharing your screen. Okay. Um, Muchas gracias. We're going to move back to Laura, who's going to be doing her presentation in English. So for those of you who need a uh, translation in Spanish, please move over to the translation lane in Spanish. And for those of you who were in the translation lane, please move back to the original one. Sorry for the confusion. And um, so once again, the presentation is going to be done in English. So if you need translation, se ocupan trans. Oh, los que están aquí ahorita, si se pueden mover a la línea de, de traducción donde estaban al principio, Natalia va a traducir en español. Y los que están en la línea de inglés, se pueden mover para atrás. Ok, we can go ahead and get started with you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for sharing all that information. And thank you, Vanessa and Natalia, for making it so flexible for the two languages. I really appreciate that. Uh, many of the things that Henry touched on uh, point to the fact, again, that we all have to work together, but I also think it's important for so many people to understand what our first responder agencies do. Um, there's these cartoon visions of them just polishing fire trucks all the time, and as you can tell, 
from Henry's presentation, there's a lot more that goes on, um, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So at this point, I want to share, what can you do? That's a big question. What can the people do? We know what the response is, as we talked about before, where they're providing the offense against the fires once the wildfires start and come into your community. But what can you do? The next series of slides, I've uh, chosen uh, examples from uh, various websites and resources that we have to show you that we have them in English and Spanish. I'm not going to go into super detail of all the things you can do because there's so much information out there. And I just want to be sure that you're aware of some of the, the key points and then are aware that there's so much available for you to, to discover and explore on what will work in your home, in your street, in your neighborhood, in your community. Obviously, creating defensible space around your home is number one. Fire likes fast food, and fast food to fire is all the leafy, flashy fuels, the high grasses that burns really quickly. And that will bring fire right up to your home faster than anything. But then it gets to your house, and your house is like that giant log on a campfire. If you've ever tried to uh, prepare a campfire or even a fire in, in your fireplace, if you just put a great big log on the stand and hold a match up to it, it's very difficult for that log to catch on fire. You have to use kindling. And if you look at the material around your home, whether it's branches or grass or weeds or small bushes, that's the kindling and your home is like that giant log. So we need to educate people to look at their home as a piece of firewood and, and look at what they need to do to remove that kindling. Because your house is, is if you create, if you harden your home and make it so it's that giant log, then the match or a simple fire is not gonna catch it on fire as easily. But if you have a lot of slash and debris and woody material and weeds and branches around your home, you're inviting the fire to come in and then it can build up the power and heat necessary to burn your home. So again, it's educating people on these simple concepts that are easy to address. Wildfire is coming. Are you ready? Looking at your home as zones, and in the examples I'm sharing, there's zone one and zone two. Uh, zone one is up to 30 feet from your home. Zone two goes up to 100 feet. And these are standard codes and ordinances in the public resource code. Coming soon to the state of California, they now have zone zero. And that is gonna be within five or six feet of your home. That's not official yet, but many insurance agencies and many municipalities are adopting that five foot zone right adjacent to your structure for a more intense type of clearance that you need to do around your home to make it less attractive to wildfire. As I said, wildfire likes fast food. It wants to burn along the ground and up into your home and up and through the trees. If we create defensible space around our homes and at the base of the trees, the fire doesn't get higher. Um, they have what they call ladder fuels, which is shown in that graphic that says the vertical spacing. The ladder fuels is literally like a ladder allowing the fire to climb up into the canopy of the trees. So these are very simple things that you can do if you look around your property and again, think like the fire. What will draw it into the trees? What will draw it into your home? Very simple things that you can do to make a difference on how your home is gonna be attacked by that fire. How to prepare your home. 
Basically, you've got your vegetation management, your home ignition zones, again, the immediate zone or zone zero, the intermediate zone, and the extended zone. What I'm sharing right now is from NFA, the National Fire Prevention Association and Firewise USA. This is an example to show what the last graphic was from CAL FIRE. Many, many entities out there have information and I say absorb them all, devour them all, and then pick the things that resonate with you and your community because they, yes, they may all say the same thing, but they share them in different ways. And that's why I've chosen to share a lot of the graphics that may look the same. Fire resistant construction, they're now calling that home hardening. You talk with your roofing, your vents, decks and porches, siding and windows. Um, roofing is very important because embers that come from fires can blow up to a mile away, in some cases more. And the most recent fire we had in our mountains in 2007, the most recent large fire, there were homes that were three miles away from the heart of the firestorm and an ember would land on their deck and start that house on fire. So it's very, very important to think about, again, it's going to draw the fire into your home. What will be attractive? It lands on your roof. It gets in your gutters. If your gutters aren't clean, those pine needles and leaves that are in your rain gutters are perfect examples of kindling that again, can allow the fire to build up enough to take out your home. On your decks and porches, look at, again, what do you have on there? Do you have the deck furniture? Do you have bamboo furniture? What are the things you have that is kindling that will attract the fire? It talks about siding and windows. Um, the heat in some fires can also actually cause the windows to crack and that allows the heat and the fire and the embers to come inside your house. So a lot of people now it's recommended that you have double paned windows or even triple paned windows. These are simple things you can do around your house that we don't think about when we buy a house specifically. And then of course, be prepared. Prepare your house, but be prepared yourself for evacuation. Listos California has emergency preparedness tips. You can sign up for alerts and uh, there are many, many apps you can have to your phone that will give you alerts on fires in your area. You can make a plan. Evacuation isn't just about walking out the door and driving away from the fire. You need to prepare in advance. What if you have pets, you have children? What if you're at work down the hill or away from the community when the fire starts? Who's going to help with your pets and your children or maybe an elderly relative? You know, these are things that you need to think about ahead of time. You need to plan because without that plan, the evacuation is going to be a much more traumatic experience and you're going to suffer greater losses if indeed your home is caught in the wildfire. A story I like to share was one I heard early on in our fire safe experiences from a gentleman who was with the Laguna Beach Fire Safe Council. Laguna Beach in the 80s and 90s had a lot of, of wildfire experiences down there. And he tells a story about sitting on his deck with his wife, drinking wine, watching a fire on an adjacent neighborhood rolling the hills with the flames and the smoke and you know and, and monitoring the progress of that fire they did that for a couple nights again just watching it enjoying their wine or their dinner out on the deck and on the third night they got a knock on the door and they were told they needed to evacuate because that fire was going to be there in probably 30 minutes they were not prepared for that it spent two or three days watching the fire burn assuming it was going to be put out the first responders are doing everything they can. Again, it's a wildfire. It isn't always that easy to control. This gentleman likes to say that he quickly grabbed an extension cord. He has no idea why. He does say that it is now his very favorite extension cord because that's literally all he walked out of this home with. His wife did manage to get some personal effects, photos, etc. But there's so much more 
that was left behind that they lost in the fire because they didn't plan and they didn't prepare. They weren't ready to go. His name was Dave. I like to say, go be Dave. Plan ahead. Make sure you have a go bag. Make sure you're ready. When you evacuate, you may not be home for two weeks as we weren't in the 2003. We were away from our homes for two weeks. You have to take the medication you need. If you have pets, do you have pet food? If they have medication, do you have it? You have special sentimental toys for your children. And then we all have our photographs, our mom, um, special mementos, things that mean a lot to us. Plan ahead for how you're going to evacuate. How are you going to leave your home? If you had to leave your home in five minutes, what would you take? What would you package it in? You know, people think, okay, I'm going to box everything in the car. Do you have boxes? Are they just sitting around? Think about using a drawer from a chest or drawer from a dresser. You can empty out your socks and fill it with those special things you need to take and put that in the back of your car. If you have a lot of special things that are heavy and take two or three people to move and you don't have a truck, then maybe during wildfire season in your area, you may want to think about storing that elsewhere. Same with your photos and, and, and very special effects. Put those someplace safe if you have a seasonal fire, which in California, we usually have fire year round nowadays, but plan ahead so that you can be prepared to evacuate and it'll be less stressful and you will know that you've done everything you can to protect what's important to you. Don't wait, evacuate. You don't have to wait till the knock on the door to leave your home. If you see smoke and if you're ready, and you know it's coming your way, follow the applications, follow the websites and links we'll be providing later and make your decision and leave soon. It's easier for the first responders to do their job if they're not caught up with all of the people on the roads that are trying to evacuate or that don't evacuate and then get in the way. Let them do their job. You do your part in preparation and creating the defensible space and then we leave and let them do their job, which is in the offense and fighting the fires and protecting our homes. This is another example of wildfire home retrofit. All of this is literature that is available to you and has a lot more information. And again, explore, research, reach out. There's a great deal of information there and some of it will make a difference for you and your home and your community. And now I'd like to turn it over to Elba. Good morning, thank you, Laura. Hi everyone, before we move on to um, Elba, oh, sorry. Elba will be presenting in Spanish. So if you could, Lastly, if you need translation in English, if you can move over to the translation line, um, you can have the presentation in English. But Elba will be presenting in Spanish. So those of you in the Spanish translation, please migrate over one last time to this uh, main line. So again, one more time, sorry for making it confusing. Please swap over. So if you need translation in English, please move over to the interpretation line that says Spanish. And for those of you in the Spanish translation line now, move over to this line, which will be in Spanish. And I will pass it over to you, Elba. Gracias, Vanessa. Buenos días a todos. Y muchas gracias por su tiempo y la oportunidad que me dan aquí. Me llamo Elba Martínez, soy una agente de seguridad aquí en la oficina de Boño Pizarro. Tenemos el producto de Farmers y aparte de eso podemos um, ponerlos con otros seguros si ustedes no cualifican con Farmers. Pero quería darle una información que es muy importante acerca de cómo entender nuestros cubrimientos. give information about how um, to uh, make sure that you have the insurance that you need. Okay, un momentito, 
por favor. Oh, ok. Gracias. Um, quería hablar primero acerca de entendiendo nuestras coberturas. Las coberturas acerca del seguro de nuestro hogar depende mucho en el tipo de um, la situación que su casa está. Por ejemplo, si usted es un propietario y vive en su casa, si la casa está vacante, si usted tiene un inquilino, uh, si es una propiedad que la usa nomás temporalmente durante las temporadas y también si está siendo remodelada por construcción. Cada situación es diferente uh, porque, por ejemplo, si usted tiene un inquilino en su casa, Usted no es responsable en caso de un incendio que su inquilino um, tenga propiedad dañada. Esa es la responsabilidad de su inquilino que él o ella tenga su propia aseguranza. Aquí sí que es muy importante que cuando usted revise su póliza de su casa con su agente de seguro, que especifique exactamente qué es el propósito de el seguro para su casa. Como le digo, si la está ocupando, si está vacante, si tiene un inquilino, si no la usa durante um, la temporada o si va a estar construida o remolada. Y ahora quisiera hablar acerca de, acerca de los deducibles de seguro de un hogar. Aquí... Eh, le voy a explicar, en esta situación vamos a hablar acerca de su casa, qué es un deducible. Un deducible es lo que sale de su bolsillo. Um, hay muchas cantidades de deducibles que usted puede escoger cuando um, compra una póliza de casa. Sabiendo qué es lo que usted puede um, sacar de su bolsillo en una situación cuando haya un reclamo como un incendio, los vientos causan daños a su techo, eso es muy importante. Um, cuando usted va a hacer un reclamo con su seguridad de su hogar. En este ejemplo que tengo aquí, um, es como usted va a presentar un reclamo para su casa, daños de casa, como le digo, en una situación de un incendio o de los vientos. También hay reclamos que su seguridad de hogar um, protege y eso es en caso que una persona se lastime en su propiedad. Alguien que viene a visitarlo, se cae, se lastima y quiere hacer un reclamo, también um, su seguridad de su hogar cubre eso. Pero acerca de los deductivos, Vamos a ver aquí qué es lo que usted paga primero de su bolsillo. ¿Qué va a salir primero de su bolsillo? Ya que usted um, pague lo de su bolsillo para su reclamo, como le digo, de un incendio y una, uh, unos vientos, es cuando la aseguranza paga el resto bajo la póliza. Pero hay dos opciones que usted tiene. Como dueño de la propiedad, usted puede um, pagar el deducible que sale de su bolsillo y la aseguranza paga el resto por su reclamo para uh, reparar los daños de su casa. O puede pedir que la aseguranza le dé un cheque y cuando le dan el cheque, usted es responsable por um, hablar con un contratista para que as, ellos hagan los res, las reparaciones a su casa. Y la otra cosa importante de saber es que cuando uno tiene una situación, cuando su hogar fue dañado, por ejemplo, en esta um, foto, cuando un árbol cae en su casa y le daña su casa, hay un incendio, o el viento toma el techo de su casa, hay un cubrimiento que se llama el cubrimiento de vivienda adicional. En esta situación, lo que hace es que la aseguranza le paga a usted por estando um, 
mientras su casa está siendo reparada temporalmente, usted puede um, estar en un hotel mientras su casa está um, temporalmente inhabitable después de esa pérdida de fuego, de viento o de un árbol um, dañando su casa y le pagan para el hotel y aparte de eso uh, le hacen un, um, un pago para comida. Pero todo esto es temporal y depende de eh, los meses que usted um, decida tener el cubrimiento. Hay unos de 12 meses o de 24 meses y también hay un máximo que ellos pagan. Pero eso es nomás cuando um, su casa está bajo construcción por una pérdida. Y también la hay unas aseguranzas que ofrecen um, el cubrimiento de pagar para una hipoteca mientras usted está fuera de su casa por reparaciones. No todas las aseguranzas ofrecen este cubrimiento. Aquí sí que es importante hablar con su agente de seguros para ver si ellos ofrecen ese cubrimiento. Um, también es muy importante cuando uno hace un reclamo bajo la seguranza de su casa, que tome fotos o un video de toda la propiedad que tiene personal en su casa para cuando haga el reclamo pueda um, dar eso como documentación de los daños que ha sufrido. Um, espero que esta información sea útil para ustedes. Muchas gracias otra vez por su atención y tiempo y que pasen un buen día. Perfecto. Gracias, Elba. Muy informativo. ¿Alguna gracias. pregunta para Elba? ¿Alguna pregunta para Elba? Um, aquí tengo una pregunta y si, la voy a leer en inglés, pero si me puedes dar la respuesta en, en español para que nuestra traductora lo diga en inglés. Um, dice, do insurance companies offer discounts for homes? Um, las compañías de seguridad ofrecen descuentos en casas uh, en el WUI que tienen fire resistant landscaping. Only, uh, no más si las, sí, no más si las reconocen por um, el Firewise certificado. Si tienen ese certificado que es um, por Firewise, sí ofrecemos ese descuento en la póliza de su hogar. Y Laura también tiene muchas información acerca de esos detalles también. Gracias. ¿Alguna, alguna otra pregunta um, que pueden poner en el chat? Si no, muchísimas gracias, Elba. Compartimos su um, correo electrónico y su información con los que se registraron el día de hoy para si tienen más preguntas. Ok. And then, um, Laura, are you doing a different section? Ok. So, lastly, uh, sí, a todos los que están aquí, pueden, uh, Laura va a hacer una presentación final. Si se puede transferir para atrás a la línea de interpretación de español, uh, Natal, Natalia la va a dar en español. Y los que están en español se pueden venir para atrás a, este, a esta línea porque va a estar en inglés. So, Laura va a dar su presentación en inglés. Si se pueden transferir para atrás con Natalia para los que necesitan traducción en español. Ok. Y los que están en español, por favor, muévanse de nuevo para esta línea. Un segundo. Ok, Laura, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you so much. So, in, in conclusion here, we're going to share some resources for you. I think, hang on. Oh, 
One moment. There we go. Okay, so we're going to be sharing these, just some resources. Um, we really appreciate your time today and to actually go into all the detail, as I said before, of all the resources that are out there uh, would take a lot more than an hour and a half. And so uh, some basic information here for you. These are all links of different places you can go to get different information. Not only do they have some of the uh, single page information sheets that I shared previously, many of them have videos you can watch. Some of them have exercises you can go through online to help determine, is your home prepared for wildfire? Is your property prepared for wildfire? They will also go into detail about what some of the different codes mean and why. And I think that's really important. Um, when we talk about class A roofs or double pane windows, it's important to understand why. And as I mentioned with the embers, a lot of people think of embers as those little sparks that fly out of your fireplace. In a major wildfire, the embers are the size of rocks and they blow through the air because of the, the the, the turbulence and the air and the weather that the fire itself creates. And that's why they can travel so far. And so these websites and these links will provide you with information, not just of what you need to do, but why. It's really good explanations that will help you look at wildfire in a different way, perhaps. It's not something we have to fear. It's something we need to prepare for, and we can prepare. If you take any of the information that's provided through the um, webinar today, through these slides, and if you do one thing every day or one thing a week, it can be small. It can be weed whacking. It can be pulling weeds. It can be trimming your trees. It can be looking at the bushes that are around your property. It can be looking inside your property. What are the things that you have flammable on your porch? Looking at the firewood that might be stacked next to your house because it's convenient. Well, you need to move the firewood away from your house. There's little things one at a time that you can do to make a difference in how your home survives a wildfire. As we've said earlier, in California especially, it's not if, it's when. And we have to be ready for the when. And once you feel confident in what you've learned, the next step is to share that with your neighbors and to share that within your community. And if you don't have a fire safe council, consider creating one. It's very simple. It's a matter of bringing people together and talking about what you need to do. You don't have to form an organization in a 501c3. If you do, that helps get grants, but that's not part of making a difference. What's making a difference, as we said earlier, is the connections, communications, networking, and partnerships with your local fire departments, sheriff's departments, because they're the ones that will help evacuate. Dispatch, CHP, they clear the roads. All of these pieces come together, working with your local utilities because they're very, very engaged right now in fire prevention. They recognize their role and how some of their lines have caused fires in the past. So again, do your part one piece at a time, one step at a time, use the resources and then reach out if you have questions on what else that you can do because I've been working in the Fire Safe Council, as you said, since 1997. And guess what? I still have stuff to do. There's always one more thing I can do to make a difference where I live. So wildfire is coming. Plan, prepare, stay aware, be prepared, not surprised. That's what makes a difference. Thank you so much for letting us share today. I'd like to thank Henry and Elba for their parts. And I'd like to thank Vanessa and Natalia and the Hispanic Access Foundation for inviting us to share with you today.
Thank you so much, Alara and Elba and Henry for being here today. That was such an insightful and interesting presentation, right? All of these resources are often left unnoticed and we don't really know that they're um, at the reach of a click or um, that they're accessible for our communities. So thank you again for being here today. Um, and if there are any other questions in the chat, please go ahead and chat us up or you can unmute yourself if you have any questions at all. Um, if not, I think I did have um, another question here that wasn't addressed and it's in the chat. It said, do housing developments in mountains or in the WUI um, make it more difficult and dangerous for firefighters? I think that's a good question. Um, I'm sorry, Henry's not here, but I'd like to say while in the mountains, some look at the mountains as being um, having more dangers because of where we live. But Southern California is full of communities that aren't ready for wildfire. And any area that is going to be open to burning is dangerous for firefighters. The, the most dangerous areas in our mountains are those with very narrow roads. And you have very narrow roads in many, many places. If you look at the Cedar Fire in San Diego in 03, it wasn't in the mountains. And yet dozens of people lost their lives. So uh, the danger doesn't come necessarily from the locale. The danger comes from the preparedness and then how maybe sometimes a neighborhood is laid out. If you have, uh, again, very narrow roads does make it difficult for the fire department to get into an area and it can make uh, egress greater of danger. But by creating the deep ends around your home, you're creating an environment where they can come in and protect your home in a safe fashion. So it does create the need for more awareness when you live in a wooey or wildland urban interface area. We have to be more aware than perhaps in a neighborhood where there are tiled roofs and um, you know a lot more asphalt, but everything still can burn. And like I said, the this was highlighted in the 03 fires where the neighborhoods in San Diego from the old fire uh, San Diego, San Bernardino in the old fire, that fire burnt up into the mountains and it burned down into North San Bernardino where they have tiled roofs. And those houses burned down because people didn't have proper venting and the embers blew into their attics and the houses burned down from the inside out. So in the old fire, we had very modern urbanized neighborhoods that lost three, 400 homes, along with the mountain homes up in the forest where we lost four or 500 homes. So again, it wasn't the environment, it was the preparedness of the homes and what the people had done to have a home hardened, resilient property. Wow, wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for all of the great questions. And if you do have any more questions, I will be sharing um, Laura's and Elba's and Henry's um, information and resources that I will be sending through email. And then also, lastly, thank you so much to our wonderful interpreter, Natalia, who does such a great job in being flexible and navigating both the English and Spanish translations. So round of applause for Natalia. Also, thank you. <laughs> also stay tuned because Hispanic Access Foundation still has two more trainings on wildfires. We have next week on the 13th, Wednesday 13th, we have uh, another training with Doug Green from Headwater Economics. And then on Thursday 14th, we've got a presentation on wildfire ecology and habitat with Luis Vidal with American Forest. So stay tuned for next week and I hope to see you all there. Um, thank you again, Laura and Elba um, for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, thank you all so very much. Thank, thank you. Everyone.